want to mention <coughs> um, Moon and Vivian have volunteered to set up the hall on Saturdays when they can. Uh, that saves us some running around on a Sunday morning. So we want to say thank you to them. So they've now got keys to the to the building. They came up yesterday and did that. So thank you to them and thank you to all of you who are involving yourselves in, in various ways <coughs> at the moment. We'll be talking more about that, Lord willing, next week. There are a couple of TV shows which Lavinia and I have uh, regularly watched uh, for quite a few years. Uh, one is called Bargain Hunt, and in that two competing uh, teams go to uh, antique sales and they buy uh, several things within a budget. And the aim then is to see which of the teams makes the highest profit or the lowest loss when those items are auctioned. The other show that has been going for a long, long time is the Antique Road Show. Uh, and that's a show where a team of experts travels around the UK and um, <clears throat> people come to them with their own antiques to have those antiques uh, valued. And what sometimes happens in both of these shows is that people have either bought something very cheaply, relatively cheaply, or they've had something sitting at home which they didn't think much of, and it turns out that that item is actually worth a great deal of money. And so something which they, in some cases, kept in an attic or in the back of a cupboard um, was something very, very precious. And that's what Jesus is talking about here in the passage that was just read to us from Matthew chapter 21. Uh, Jesus says there in, in verse 42, The stone or a stone which the builders rejected, this has become the chief cornerstone. So here was a, a lump of, of rock that the builders building a building didn't think much of, they put it aside, but it turned out that piece of rock actually had a preeminent role in the building that was built. Um, so the idea is that, again, something to which people might give little significance turns out to have a great deal of significance. But what was Jesus talking about when he talked about this stone? A stone which the builders rejected, this has become the chief cornerstone. Well, Jesus in this context had just been speaking a parable, uh, an illustration that uh, teaches a lesson. And in this parable, beginning in Matthew 21 and verse 33, you see that there is a, a landowner. He plants a vineyard and he constructs the various buildings that go along with that. And he leases that property out to some others and he goes away on a journey. And harvest time approaches and the landowner sends some of his servants to receive his portion of the grapes. <laughs> However, the tenants do not react very well to the servants. They turn against them, they beat one, they kill another, they stone a third. So the landowner sends more servants and they are treated exactly the same way. And thus down in Matthew 21 verse 30, uh, seven, the landowner sends his son, thinking that the tenants will respect the son, but on the contrary, the tenants kill the son with the aim of seizing the property for their own. Having 
described this parable, Jesus then asked the question of his hearers in verse 40. Therefore, when the owner of the vineyard comes, what will he do to those vine growers? And his, Jesus' hearers give an answer in verse 41. They said to him, he will bring those wretches to a wretched end and lease the vineyard to other vine growers who will pay him the fruit in the proper seasons. Now there are some gathered there who realize that the, prophet, the uh, parables Jesus is saying actually apply to them. Down in Matthew 21 verse 45, when the chief priests and the Pharisees heard his parables, they understood that he was speaking about them. Now in the parable, the indication is that the landowner was God, represents God. And the servants that he sends that are mistreated signify the prophets. God had sent prophets to Israel for many years and oftentimes those prophets had been opposed, in some cases uh, mistreated and killed. And the son, well the son's Jesus Christ. And not long after this parable, Jesus was going to be crucified because of people plotting against him. And the, uh, the uh, tenants, well the tenants are the religious leaders who rather than fulfilling their duty, in actual fact, worked against God and worked against Christ, even calling for the sacrifice, calling for the uh, death of Christ, the crucifixion of Christ. The message is that they are going to face judgment. And it's in the context of that parable that Jesus gives the quote in Matthew 21 and verse 42. Jesus asks his hearers, Did you never read in the scriptures a stone which the, st uh, the builders rejected? This has become the chief cornerstone. This came about from the Lord, and it is marvellous in our eyes. In that, Jesus is quoting from Psalm 118, verses 22 and 23. You'll notice the words are very much the same here. Psalm 118, verse 22, A stone which the builders rejected has become the chief cornerstone. This came about from the Lord, it is marvellous in our eyes. Now, here in Psalm 118, the psalmist describes how God had brought him through difficult times. So he speaks, first of all, on a personal level, and then he switches to the plural uh, in verses 23 down to verse 27. I'm still in Psalm 118 here. And the indication is that having spoken about God's deliverance of himself, he then speaks about God's deliverance of Israel. Uh, you'll notice here it uses words like our in verse 23, uh, verse 24, let's, which means let us. Uh, verse 25, uh, please Lord do save us. And then... Um, Verse 26, we have blessed you. So again, the plural there, apparently talking about uh, God's help for Israel. And so the indication is that in Psalm 180, verse 22, the stone which the builders rejected, in that context, that stone was Israel. It was the stone which had been rejected, but... It became the chief cornerstone. It became something of great significance. God had chosen this small tribe of Israelites, which at first faced much opposition, and God had raised them up, and God had chosen, not because of Israel's deservedness, but because of his own will, to use that small nation for his purposes and to establish what would lead up to the salvation of the world through Jesus Christ. What's a cornerstone? Well, 
Let me read to you a definition from the Illustrated Bible Dictionary. It can indicate one of the large stones near the foundation of a building, which by its sheer size binds together two or more uh, rows of stones, but is more likely to refer to the final stone which completes an arch or is laid at the top corner of the building. So again, the idea is the builders looked at this stone, uh, didn't think it was of any significance, but God chose that stone to top off his building. That was the significant stone for God to carry out his purposes. In the Old Testament context, God chose Israel to carry out his purposes. However, in Psalm 118, there is also what we call a messianic element, Messiah, the Christ. And there are prophecies concerning Jesus Christ in Psalm 118. For instance, the first part of Psalm 118 and verse 26 is quoted in Matthew 21 and verse 9 in regard to those who welcomed Jesus at the time of his triumphal entry into Jerusalem a week prior to his death. Psalm 118 and verse 26 is also applied to Jesus in Matthew 23 and verse 39. Going back to Matthew, uh, sorry, to Psalm 118 and verse 22, well, we've seen it used over in Matthew chapter 21, but this psalm is also quoted several other times, plainly referring to Jesus Christ. For instance, we can go over to Acts, the fourth chapter, beginning in verse 10. And here Peter and John have been brought before the Jewish council uh, after they raised someone who uh, had been lame and attracted great attention from the crowds. And so the council uh, demands an explanation of them. Peter responds in Acts 4 and verse 10, let it be known to all of you and to all the people of Israel that by the name of Jesus Christ the Nazarene, whom you crucified, whom God raised from the dead, by this, this man stands here before you in good health. That's the man that had been healed. He, talking of Jesus, is the stone which was rejected by you, the builders, but which became the chief cornerstone. So there Peter says that, quote from Psalm 118 refers to Jesus. You can also see it um, over in Ephesians chapter 2 and verse 19 where it pictures the church as a building comprised of people who have come to Christ, the Jews and the Gentiles, both have been united in Christ. So Ephesians chapter 2 verse 19 so then, says Paul to the Ephesians, you are no longer strangers and foreigners, but you are fellow citizens with the saints and are of God's household, having been built on the foundation of the apostles and prophets, Christ Jesus himself being the cornerstone in whom the whole building being fitted together is growing into a holy temple in the Lord. So again, it's talking about Jesus Christ. He was rejected but he became the chief cornerstone here. And then one more passage at the moment, and that's over in 1 Peter chapter 2, and I'll read first of all from verses 4 and 5. 1 Peter 2 verse 4, And coming to him, to Christ, as to a living stone, which has been rejected by the people, but is choice and precious in the sight of God, you also as living stones are being built up as a spiritual house for a holy priesthood to offer spiritual sacrifices that are acceptable to God through Jesus Christ. And then if you jump down to verse 7, this precious value then is for you who believe, but for unbelievers, a stone which the builders rejected, this became the chief cornerstone. So you see this theme runs through the New Testament. The idea that Christ would be rejected like builders tossing aside a stone that they don't think is worth anything. And yet 
God in his purposes raising Jesus to being someone of great significance. He of the greatest significance. People had rejected Jesus when he was on earth. They called out for his crucifixion. But the one that they tossed aside, he was to be elevated above all and the cause of hope for all. For instance, we can go back to Acts chapter 2 where Peter is preaching in Jerusalem just weeks after the uh, crucifixion then the resurrection of Jesus Christ. And I'll pick it up in Acts chapter 2 and verse 32. It is this Jesus whom God raised up a fact to which we are all witnesses, the, the apostles. Therefore, verse 33, since he has been exalted at the right hand of God and has received the promise of the Holy Spirit from the Father, he has poured out this which you both see and hear. That's talking of the Holy Spirit. For it was not David who ascended into heaven, but he himself, David, says, the Lord said to my Lord, Sit at my right hand until I make your enemies a footstool for your feet. That again is a prophecy of Jesus. Verse 36. Therefore let all the house of Israel know for certain that God has made him both Lord and Christ, this Jesus whom you crucified, this Jesus whom you rejected, is now Lord and Christ, Lord and Messiah. I read a while ago from Acts chapter 4, beginning in verse 10 there, uh, where Peter was addressing the, Jew, uh, the uh, Jewish council. And uh, Peter goes on in Acts 4 and verse 12 to say, There is salvation in no one else, for there is no other name among heaven that has been given among mankind which, by which we must be saved. The stone that was rejected, Jesus Christ, is the one whom God has given to provide us with salvation. And I particularly like the description given in the book of Philippians chapter 2, where it talks about the humility and the uh, unselfishness demonstrated by Christ who acted for our benefit. If, uh, Philippians chapter 2, and I'll read here from verse 8. This is talking of Jesus. And being found in appearance as a man, he humbled himself by becoming obedient to the point of death, death on a cross. For this reason also God highly exalted him and bestowed on him the name which is above every name, so that at the name of Jesus every knee will bow of those who are in heaven and on earth and under the earth, and that every tongue will confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. He has been raised up to the right hand of God and every knee will bow before him. So this one whom the people cried out for his crucifixion, God raised him up to power and to glory. And the evidence of that lies in the historical fact of his resurrection. And I've talked about that at other times. This isn't just a story. This is something that is historical. It happened. So that's one way in which Jesus is referred to in prophecy as a stone. But there is another reference too. Um, a while ago, I took you over to 1 Peter chapter 2, and we're going back there now. And in 1 Peter chapter 2 and verse 7, Peter quotes from Psalm 118 verse 22. But there's some other quotes here in 1 Peter chapter 2. I'm going to read from verses 6 and then verse 8. So 1 Peter 2 verse 6, For this is contained in Scripture, Behold, I am laying in Zion a choice stone, a precious cornerstone, and the one who believes in him will not be put to shame. And then verse 8, a stone of stumbling and a rock of offence. 
Now, those two quotes are from the book of Isaiah in the Old Testament. First Peter 2 and verse 6 is a quote from Isaiah chapter 28 and verse 16. Uh, First Peter 2 and verse 8 are quotes from Isaiah chapter 8 and verse 14. Jesus, as we've already seen, is referred to as a stone. It's not literal, it's an illustration. And as Peter quotes in 1 Peter 2 and verse 6, uh, God said that he would lay in Zion a choice stone, a precious cornerstone, and the one who believes in him will not be put to shame. So again, Jesus is something valuable. But to others, down in verse 8, Jesus is a stone of stumbling and a rock of offence. Why? Well, read on in verse 8. For they stumble because they are disobedient to the word, and to this they were also appointed. They are, again in verse 7, unbelievers. Now, what does it mean that Jesus is a stone of stumbling. Well, we understand what it is to stumble, trip over something. Basically, your foot strikes uh, a hard object and you lose your footing and you can topple over. As for offence, a rock of offence, uh, Vine, in his Dictionary of New Testament Words, says that the Greek word in the New Testament is always used metaphorically and ordinarily of anything that arouses prejudice or becomes a hindrance to others or causes them to fall by the way. Sometimes the hindrance is in itself good and those who stumble by it are the wicked. So the point is, the fact that something is a stumbling block doesn't mean it's bad. In this case, Jesus was a stumbling block and he was good, but people stumble because of their own disbelief, their own wickedness, as, as we had it explained here by a guy. So, even though Jesus Christ is good, even though Jesus Christ is the source of salvation, some don't like it. Come over to 1 Corinthians chapter 1, and verse 23. There were Jews, there were many, many Jews who believed in Jesus and turned to Jesus, but there's others who rejected Jesus because of their own preconceptions. 1 Corinthians chapter 1 and verse 23, Paul says there, but we preach Christ crucified to the Jews a stumbling block and to Gentiles foolishness. Why was Christ crucified a stumbling block to the Jews? Well, Somebody who was crucified was a guilty person and a low person for that because the higher people were not crucified. So to a Jew, it just didn't fit their concept. What they expected was a Messiah of the nature of King David, a warrior king who would lead them to great victory, not somebody nailed to a cross or to a stake between two thieves as a, as a criminal. So they couldn't handle that idea. Or you can go back to uh, Romans chapter 9 and verse 30 there. Romans 9 verses 30 to 33. What shall we say then? That Gentiles who did not pursue righteousness attained righteousness but the righteousness that is by faith. However, Israel, pursuing the law of righteousness, did not arrive at that law. Why? Because they did not pursue it by faith, but as though they could by works. They stumbled over the stumbling stone, just as it is written, Behold, I am laying in Zion a stone of stumbling and a rock of offence, and the one who believes in him will not be put to shame. It says here, that, yes, the Gentiles found salvation. They didn't set out to do so, but salvation, the news of salvation was preached to them and they found salvation through faith. But Paul here says there were many Jews who did not find salvation in Christ because it 
they weren't willing to do so by faith. What they wanted was works uh, by law here. They were so filled with the Old Testament concept of keeping certain laws and they thought, well, if we keep and usually it was certain of those laws, then we're okay. As long as we do certain things, that makes us Jewish and that makes us God's people. But no, that wasn't the way of salvation. Salvation is through faith in Christ and faith in God. Many did find that, but others couldn't because again of their own preconceptions and thus they stumbled over the stone, which was Jesus Christ. Salvation was being offered to them freely by God. It was there. But they didn't want it. They turned their back upon it. Christ was the stone who could so easily have been their salvation, and instead he became the cause of of their downfall just as we saw in Peter's quote in first Peter chapter 2 and verse 8 Jesus for them became a stone of stumbling and a rock of offense and we can go back to a text over in Matthew chapter 21 and uh, we find a bit more there uh, down in Matthew 21 and verse 44. And incidentally, both 1 Peter 2 and verse 8 and Matthew 21 and verse 44 are quoting from Isaiah chapter 8 verses 14 and 15. Uh, but Matthew 21 and verse 44, the one who falls on this stone will be broken to pieces and on whomever it falls, it will crush him. It will be their downfall. Not because God set out for it to be that way, but because they rejected the salvation which God had granted, made so freely available to them. So, Jesus during his time on earth was rejected by many and as a result crucified. But in his sacrificial death, he became the means of salvation and God raised him to glory and to power. And many of those who had called for Jesus' crucifixion at that time very quickly realized their mistake. Luke tells us that when Jesus had been crucified and had died, many walked away from the sight beating their breasts because they knew something very wrong had taken place. And that's the way it's been ever since people rejected Jesus back then and people have rejected Jesus down through the ages and people are still doing that today. But others look at the evidence. They look at the biblical record. They find out about Christ and about God and they turn to Christ. And we can have our preconceptions. We can have our biases. Some people don't want salvation. Some people don't want Christianity. They want their own way of living. But the issue here is eternal salvation. And all the blessings that go with it both here and now and for all of eternity. So are we prepared to look at the evidence? This one who was rejected, but who then rose from the dead, are we willing to find out about him? We've got a choice. We can either reject him as a builder might reject a stone, so no, no good to me. Or we can recognise him as the cornerstone the one of great value, the one in whom we have forgiveness, salvation, eternal life, and we can turn to him. Which is it going to be? He's the same Jesus to all. The question is how we perceive him. The question is what decision are we going to make about him?
obviously the right decision is to look at the evidence and to turn to him, and to let him be your saviour, to walk with him. Let's stand for sin.